Have you ever had a problem where you've gotten your application into production only to discover that performance is a problem? In this episode, I'm hopefully going to be able to help you out. Hey there, and welcome to episode 24 of Code Hour. As I mentioned in the intro, today I'm going to get into how to solve performance problems in ASP.NET Boilerplate, and specifically how to use the tool called LinkPad to solve those problems. LinkPad, if you have never used it, is a wonderful tool that will allow you to translate your link entity framework queries into SQL. So you can see the SQL that results from them, and then you can also run that SQL and get a query analysis on it in uh, back in SQL Server or whatever your backend DBMS is. By the way, if you're not familiar with ASP.NET Boilerplate, I've got um, on my blog, on my uh, YouTube channel, I've got a whole bunch of uh, videos uh, specifically on that. I've got a playlist here, ASP.NET Boilerplate, and so yeah, that's uh, it's going to give you a little bit of background there. So you might be saying, well, what is there to learn? Why is this ASP.NET Boilerplate specific? Well, the problem is that in traditional applications where you have a data context inside of your application, everything works well, but ASP.NET Boilerplate uses a repository pattern. The repository pattern is a wonderful abstraction that allows you to unit test your units of work much more easily, and it's much better architected, and it allows you to have a a unit of work pattern, and that unit of work pattern allows you to have connection and transaction management uh, with at the attribute level, at the method level, or at the app service level. And uh, that's all wonderful, but it makes diagnosing performance problems harder. So uh, today, uh, this episode, I'm going to go over two different primary techniques to take a query and to figure out what's going on and why it's performing poorly. Okay, makes sense? Let's go take a look at some code. Enough talking, right? And, oh, well, I guess there's one, one more thing I should mention, and that is that if you are going to go download LinkPad right now, today, you've got two choices that you need to know about. There's um, .NET Framework uh, 4, 6, 7. So if you're, using the, if you're using the full .NET Framework, which you're probably not if you're using ASP.NET Boilerplate, you need LinkPad 5. Um, but if you've done ASP.NET Boilerplate and you've generated it relatively recently, you're probably using .NET Core, .NET Core 3, and in which case you want LinkPad 6. So I thought I'd mention that. Okay, so imagine I have here a product app service, and in here I've got this query which is doing something, or maybe I've got this query which is doing something, and I really want to dig in and find out what's going on. Well, the first step after I've installed LinkPad is to well, create a new query. Let's make sure we've got a nice clean environment here. And I could try just, well, I guess I need I need a database connection first. So if I, oh, ignore this one right here. I'll be adding that shortly. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just actually delete this one too. So assuming you've just installed it for the first time, you can add a connection and you have the option of the built-in data context. Link to SQL is just fine if you've got a SQL Server database, which I do. You can test it here. Connection successful and OK. And so now at this point, you can just select which database you want to connect to. I've been doing Lee's store. You normally can just drag that over. Oh, yeah, there it is. And so this changed up here, changed the connection that I wanted to connect to, to Lee store DB. And now, off of the this object, if I do this dot, I can do things like get all the products and if I call dump, then that is going to write the results. I hit F5 to run that, by the way. Sorry, I do that so quick. I forget to even think about it and mention it, but yeah, under query debug, that's also F5. And now we can see that I've got these two records in the database, and it does a lot more sophisticated stuff than this. For instance, if I do ABP users, well, it's got all of my users here, but it also will do foreign keys, and you can dig into all of the data, and it'll show it all in a tree view, which is very nice. Include No, I can't because it's just a database at this point. It's not a data context. Okay, which brings us to the next point. Imagine that you wanted to, I don't know, let's say 
take a look at this query right here, which is doing a group by and then a dot select. And so it's basically doing a unique on name. This is saying I want all products, but if there's two that have the same name, then I want to exclude them. So if I take that in here, well, so problem number one with taking code, just a single little query out like this out of ASP.NET Boilerplate is that it doesn't know what a repository is. Well, how about we just do this dot products and replace that. And if I run that, it's probably going to work. Oh, yeah. except I must have accidentally deleted There we go. OK, great. So that wasn't too hard. But what if we've got something a little bit more complicated? This one joins between two different, uh, two different database tables. So if I were to take that and plunk that in here, you'll see, well, you'd say, oh, I can just do the same thing I did last time. I can say this.products. I can say this.users. Well, one problem with connecting directly to the database rather than going through a data context is that they're called different things. So um, users is what they're called in my data context and in my data repository, but they're called ABP users in the database. And if you have columns that don't quite match up and you've got uh, custom column mappings and stuff like that, you're not going to get that if you connect directly to the database. But maybe that's not that big of a deal. And so far, that looks pretty good. Um, but there's this map to entity DTO. Well, I don't really have that. So now I've got to just start fiddling. And this process of fiddling can be a bit of a, a pain. Well, I guess in this case, I wanted to um, turn it into a DTO. Well, it, under the covers, it does all of that with AutoMapper. You'll see, or sorry, yeah, auto mapper. So there's an object mapper, but how do I get this object mapper reference? Well, I can't. And even if I could, maybe I could just say, well, just return, I'll do it by hand, right? So I'll return a new product DTO with a name equal to, ah, it's already failing. By the way, I thought I'd mention one more thing. That is, I have IntelliSense because I purchased LinkPad 6. If you use the free version, which is just as good, except it doesn't have IntelliSense. So, okay, so product DTO. So I need to make a reference. So at this point, I can go over to query and then references and properties and add an additional reference to my DLL. There we go. Okay, so I want to be in the project name, ASP.NET Core, source, and the host, which is the primary thing that it runs out of, and bin, debug, ASP.NET Core. And now I could make a reference to, well, what do I really need? I need the DTO, which is defined in the application. So I could do least store.application. And now I ought to be able to. Ah, yes, it'll automatically add the using statement for me. That's nice. And now I could say name. All right, well, we've made it a little bit further, but uh, semicolon. It's going to complain about the to list async. Well, yeah, that's another problem. To list async is something which does not exist. It only exists on data contexts provided by ASP.NET Boilerplate. So I would have to take this back to dot to list. Okay, and there we go. And if we go take a look at the SQL tab, there we go. That's not so bad. We get to see the name, the quantity from products, and it's doing a left outer join just as we might have expected. That's great. But we can do better. Um, as soon as things start getting a little bit more complicated, it becomes really handy to be able to call um, to use your actual data context. And so then you get things like to list async. And so the way to do that is to update your data context so that it will take a connection string. And I'll show you why you need this in just a second. Because, actually, I'll show it to you right now. Because if you're going to add a connection, you can say, hey, I want to use my data context, the one from AS, the one that ASP.NET Boilerplate generated. And so I can choose the Entity Framework Core. 
and a path to custom assembly that will be the one that we just picked in the web host except we want the web host DLL whoops oh that's good and it wants the full name of the typed data context and I could try choosing it but it's actually going to not work it's going to complain right now because it is expecting an overload that takes a connection string but let's just go down until I get the error so over in my least stored DB context that's the data context oh I already had this code here from a previous run through of this normally it would look just like this very simple and if you want to be able to get it to support link pad then you can run over to linkpad.abp. This is a project that I just published. It's also on a blog that I published. Um, you could either go to leerichson.com or go to github.com lpritchar slash linkpad.abp and uh, just plunk in this code right here. That obviously needs to be replaced with my actual DB context. There we go. Oh, and the constructor name. There we go. Okay, so if I compile, all right, build succeeded. That's excellent. And now I can complete this step where I type the full name of my database context, which is namespace. dot class name oh and that's because I picked the wrong DLL in this case I actually wanted the DLL that the data context exists in which is in entity framework core ah and now choose actually works there we go and yes via a connection string a constructor that accepts a string that was the thing we just wrote over here so this override takes the connection string it stores the connection string over here and when it calls on configuring then it will use that connection string and i threw some uh, compiler directives in here so that you don't accidentally ship this out to production it's maybe a security thing maybe it's just me being paranoid and then I ought to be able to provide a value for that connection string. I'm going to pluck that out of my app settings.json file here. And there's really nothing fancy about that, but select that test. Hey, successful. All right, we got it. OK. And now, there it is. We've got our regular database connection and now we've got an entity framework data context connection so that's great and if I specify that new entity framework context connection you'll see the changes that I was mentioning earlier this actually should have been users and it's going through the data context and so because it's doing that it now has access to to list async and I can await and I can async task and control dot, by the way. Sorry, I'm not very good at using the mouse. Okay, and this takes a product. Okay, I'm going to run this. There we go. And that is a little bit more complicated of a query. And um, part of what's going on here is it's because it's using the data, database context and the entity framework, it's already adding in some of the filters that ASP.NET Boilerplate provides, such as is deleted and tenancy. So now you're getting a much better representation of what query is actually being run by ASP.NET Boilerplate, which is wonderful. That's, that's a, a huge step in the right direction. 
but we can do better. And to do better than that, we could actually call directly into products app service. We could call directly into this method and that becomes really handy. Like what, what I've shown you so far is wonderful if you've got relatively simple queries that you know are misbehaving, but if you have something that calls something else, that calls something else, and they maybe get results back and aggregate things and do a bunch of individual queries, uh, but you don't really know exactly where your performance problem is, but you know at a high level that it's at this high level method, then you can use this technique that I'm just going to show you to call into the high level, run everything, and you can see all the queries that are getting executed. For the purposes of this example here, I'm just going to call in to get products, but it's hopefully going to give you a sense of what you can do. And I find in the real world this is um, so much more useful for testing or for figuring out query performance problems. So that is, uh, there's a product that I released, which I, I referenced earlier, which is this linkpad.abp. So I put a little bit of work into getting this to work for me and I thought I'd go ahead and share that out on NuGet so that other people could, other people could take advantage of it. Um, it's not super complicated code but it did take me a little bit to figure out and the reason is because you need to have to to be able to call into an ASP.NET boilerplate application you need to have dependency injection working you need to have the unit of work pattern working so that it'll know when to start new database connections and when to start transactions and you need to also have the tenant, if you have multi-tenancy going on, then you need to have uh, be able to specify who the current tenant is, who the current user is that's currently logged into the app, and all those things, this pattern will take into account. So using this plugin here, you can specify who you want to be impersonating when you run this, and so you're going to get much more accurate results. So let's try and do it. To do that, you can just take this code and plunk it into LinkPad, which is, uh, well, I guess step one is actually to download the NuGet package. So if you go over to References, add a NuGet package, and we want, oh, I've actually used it recently, but normally you would do linkpad.abp, hit enter, and then it would say, hey, do you want to add linkpad.abp? And you could say, yes, add that to query. I've already downloaded it, so it downloaded super fast, but that's the process you would go through. And now we've got a reference to that, but that's not quite good enough. I'm just going to delete all of this. Let's delete all of this. Yeah, let's just copy and paste the whole chunk of code. So it's going to make me do a bunch of imports. So yes, I want to using uh, the modules. This is dependent on the entity framework module for my project, which in this case is Lee's store entity framework module. It's going to inherit from linkpad module base, which is in linkpad.abp. So it's just, uh, we need to add a reference to that. And then again here, this is not my project entity framework module. This is the least store entity framework module. Service connection, we should just be able to add a reference for that. Identity registrar, or a using statement, excuse me. And here we are. Okay, so what this code does right here, and I haven't talked about in, in any of my videos so far, I haven't talked about what modules are, but modules are, think about them as like a life cycle tie in an opportunity to tie into the life cycle of generally a DLL when it starts up and when it shuts down. And if you think about it from that perspective, then you should generally have one module per per project, per DLL. And when you have that, then you can have it say, hey, I depend on this other module. And when you make that dependency, then it will, ASP.NET Boilerplate will go over to that other module and it will start it up and it'll know to fire off all of its uh, inversion of control, dependency injection, uh, registrations, and, and whatnot. So, so that's why we need our own module here. And this module, I tried to make it as, I tried to put as much code as possible into the ASP.NET uh, linkpad.abp. So that's why you can just inherit from the base and just give it uh, as little information as possible. So we're saying we do want to skip db seeding, so we're not trying to 
do any more code than we actually need to and um, initializing services if you need to do custom uh, registration of uh, of dependency injection things, this would be the place to do it. And I left that in here. It's not strictly required, but uh, I find that as actually useful fairly frequently. LinkPad, if you didn't know this, I didn't, it caches every single query. And so it makes subsequent runs much, much, much faster. And so this little bit of code right here will initialize the module and store the module in the session for later reuse. And then last, uh, is we need to start a new unit of work. And so with this ABP context, we're going to start a unit of work. We're going to say we want to be tenant ID 5 and user ID 8. Well, I don't have multi-tenancy enabled in this site, so this tenant ID would actually be null, and that'll work fine like that. Um, or maybe I set it to 1. Actually, I think I set it to 1. Null would be the host. So yeah, tenant ID 1. The fund service is just some some whatever, some, some code, it doesn't matter. What I actually need here is I would like to get an instance of my products app service and because I'm going to call directly into this line of code right here and I'm going to get that map to entity DTO. You'll see it. So products app service. So now I have a products app service and now I can call get products directly on it like that. Oh, okay. It's close because we said we were dependent on the entity framework module, but we're also now dependent on the application. So this application here needs has a module here, at least our application module. That's another module that I am dependent on so I need to make sure that dependent that dependency those dependencies get registered let's try it now oh this is tricky you know what this is this is caching I about guarantee you so if I cancel all threads and reset then I think the second depends on will start working crossing my fingers here Fantastic. All right, so that's great. So we called directly into that and we got the select from the left join and you'll notice that the results here are actually a product DTO. The DTO was the thing that was resulted. Uh, similarly, we could call into, let's say we had a performance problem um, here in the get all and you notice how this get all calls into the parent and then it calls into over here and then runs this query over here so this is a great example of something where there's a lot more complicated going on and maybe some maybe this was where the query problem performance was or maybe there was some other query that was run in some other piece of this but we could find out for sure by just calling it's called get all but it needs one of these things Add a using statement and run it. And I think that's because user ID 8 doesn't exist, but maybe user ID 1 does. Okay, yes, this it is. That was perfect. Okay, and what's cool about this is you can see that this was actually returning pagination. It says there's two total items, and here's the list of items, and here's what's in the items. And uh, So that's it. Um, that is how to use linkpad.asp. That is how to debug performance problems in ASP.NET boilerplate with LinkPad. There's obviously a lot more to it, but this tool is amazing, and once you start digging into it, I think you're going to love it and uh, love being able to dig into performance problems, which is a real, it's, I think it's actually a really fun problem domain. So hope this was helpful to you. If so, please like and subscribe and all that stuff, and I will see you around probably next month. Cheers.